Hello everyone. Welcome to another collection conversation with the Fitta Museum. I am Museum Associate Joanna Epijoudi. We'll just wait a few minutes for some people to join. We are so excited to welcome our guest Elizabeth Way and I can't wait to introduce her. We're going to be talking about her new book, Black Designers in American Fashion. So we'll just wait a couple minutes for her to join. Hello. Where is everybody joining us from? Okay. Yay! Yay! <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it worked. Welcome, Elizabeth Way. We are so excited to have you on Collection Conversations to talk about your amazing new project. Um, so I'm going to give you a little introduction to Liz for those of you who um, aren't familiar with her wonderful body of work. Elizabeth Way is Assistant Curator of Costume at the Museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Her co-curated and curated exhibitions include Global Fashion Capitals 2015, Black Fashion Designers 2016, Fabric in Fashion 2018, and Head to Toe 2021. Way holds an MA in Costume Studies from New York University and a BS in Apparel Design and a BA in History from the University of Delaware. Her personal research focuses on the intersection of African American culture and fashion. She edited the book Black Designers in American and Fashion, just released this year in 2021 from Bloomsbury. So welcome, Elizabeth. Thank I'm you. I'm gonna call so you Liz much. because yes, we fun. are actually pals for, yes. for those of you who don't know. Liz, Liz is one of my good friends and we went to grad school together. Yes, NYU. NYU, yes, you, I think you were the year ahead of me. So you yes. might have finished a little bit before me, but that's where our paths originally crossed. So I'm so happy to see you as my friend and to talk about this amazing project. Thank <laughs> you so much for having me. So why don't you give us a little overview of what this book is? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I've done a lot of research looking at um, black fashion designers from the US and around the world. And I just really didn't find a lot of resources that look specifically at black designers. There's like some amazing work out there that looks at the dress of black communities and a lot of different capacities, styles, um, which is so, so important. But I was really looking for something that looked at designers. And so um, I was actually having lunch with um, Nancy Deal, our Yay. program director at <laughs> NYU. And she just had an amazing book that came out called um, Hidden History of American Fashion, which focused on female fashion designers. And so I was talking to her about how much I loved her book. And she's like, you know, you could do something like this with black designers. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. And then I was <laughs> like, well, Liz, you know, we should really do this. <laughs> That's what I was going to say after I read your bio. I was like, when do you sleep? <laughs> wow. Well, fortunately for this book, it's an edited volume, so I did not write the entire thing. I um, turned to this amazing group of scholars that I'd been aware of or personally worked with over the years, and um, I kind of asked them all individually um, if they would contribute chapters to this book. So I wanted to focus on Black fashion makers from the late 18th, 19th century to the end of the 20th century. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we got a lot of questions about this project, <laughs> um, some just about how you even... Um, come up with a book proposal? How do you find a publisher? You know, so that side of it, and then also just about the content of the book. So um, if you don't mind, I thought I would go through some of the questions we got from our audience. I'll be keeping my eye on the comments. So maybe some more um, questions might come up, but we'll keep it casual. And of course. Uh, so I, you know, I, you just told us how you came up with the concept of the book. And I also wanted to ask, was it connected at all with Black Fashion Designers Exhibition that you did at FIT? It wasn't necessarily connected. I mean, I obviously did so much research when I did Black Fashion Designers, and I curated it with my um, then colleague, Ariel Alaya. And I think the number one comment, or at least one of the larger comments we got about the show was like, why is there no book? And we just mm. didn't have time at that point to produce a book with it. Um, but I knew that we wanted to do bigger projects around Black designers at the museum. So I didn't want this book to be like kind of a book version of that exhibition, but just another kind of piece of scholarship that other people could turn to. Sure, sure. Um, so starting, so Nancy gives you the idea. Now, was her book Bloomsbury as well? Yes. It was. So, okay. So that was a huge um, help. She connected me with her editor. And this is an editor okay. that we've also worked with at the museum at FIT. And I'm currently working on a book with her. Um, as well for an uh, exhibition on food and fashion. That book is also oh. with Bloomsbury. So I got a real leg up um, in that 
okay. um, being connected to a publisher. And she was excited about the idea. Um, and I kind of filled out this proposal form that they have for all authors. But if you're looking to publish a book, especially an academic book, you can like, you know, go to these um, publishers websites, and they usually have resources for potential authors, like a form you can fill out um, that describes the book in detail. And, you know, if you're looking for a publisher, I would say, like, go to a book that you like, that, like, kind of the structure or the style, um, and see who published it, and reach out to them. Um, you know, all of that information is on their websites. Yeah, that's such good advice to kind of look at what you're already reading and what, or what books you already respect and, and go from there. Now, did you, so you only worked with this one publisher. Did you have to write anything or it was just the concept that they took on? No, no, I wrote a full proposal for them. Um, okay. They liked the concept, but you know, I had never published with them before. Um, so yeah. like, you know, I work with the Museum of FIT and so like Valerie Steele has an idea for the book. Publishers usually like, great, great, great. But you know, <laughs> I never done a book before. Um, so I wrote a full proposal um, okay. and you know, they asked about like, who do you think this book is gonna be marketed to and all these things. Also, additionally, Bloomsbury um, does peer review. So my um, entire manuscript, my proposal and my manuscript was, were reviewed by anonymous um, academics and they gave me feedback on how to improve um, the idea and the text. Wow, that's so interesting. What kind of feedback did you get from your initial concept? Um, for, the, for the proposal, I actually don't remember exactly. I remember for the actual manuscript, I remember the, the reviewer was like, this is riddled with typographical errors. I was like, well, that's, that's great. Oh no. Um, I mean, like, it hadn't gone through copy editing yet, so, it, like, I was like, okay. Um, but they had really helpful ideas, like, for example, um, each of my authors um, had a chapter that was 5,000 words. And in the end, some things shifted around, so some chapters ended up being longer. But the peer reviewers, like, you know, I'd like to see more specific examples, like, in this chapter. And going back to my authors, they were like, oh, no, I'd love to get more examples. I just didn't think I had the word count. So, sure. like, kind of um, looking at that. But in general, the reviews were really, um, really positive and encouraging and really just kind of mostly looking for more specific information. Um, Amazing. Terms. Like, we want more. We want more. Yeah. I'm obsessed with the word riddled with typographical <laughs> errors. I'm going to try to use that as much as possible. I was, it was a little. It was, it was a little. I mean, like, you know, copy editing is not my forte. Which I definitely went through, like, they're very talented copy editors at Bloomsbury. But at that point, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> riddled with errors. <laughs> That's so great. Ugh. Um, so you, okay, what was your time? We had a question about the time frame between the proposal and, um, like your proposal to when you got the contract to like manuscript submission. I'm trying to think. So I want to say that this was maybe 2018 or so. I, I'm terrible with dates when it comes to that, but it was probably like a two year process. Oh, I would okay. say that it was about two years, maybe two and a half if they start from like the proposal stage. Um, so okay. it definitely takes time. Yeah. Um, but you know, there are periods where like, you know, you send the proposal off and then you have to wait a while. I'm sure they field hundreds of proposals. And then, you know, we submitted the manuscript and then we had to wait a few months um, to get those peer review comments back. So it's not like constant grind of work that entire time, but it's certainly right. something that's like on your list. You're waiting for it to um, come through, but it was about two years. Is it kind of a hurry up and wait? Like uh, when you do get the review, they're like, we need this in a week or- Oh, no, 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 they gave us time. I think they gave us a couple months and, you know, I was working with 10 different authors. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot to coordinate. It's a lot to coordinate. And like everyone's schedules were different. Most of these people are professors. So like, you know, like fall and like the end of spring, not great times for them to work on manuscripts. So, um, we didn't have too many problems with the deadline and I definitely worked in a lot of buffer times with my okay. authors because I know that, you know, things come up. Um, but yeah, the blues Ray gave us a good amount of time to get back to them too. Great. Right. Um, so, you mentioned your authors and that was something else we wanted to talk about. So this is your first time as an editor. So as the editor of the book, was it up to you to select the authors? Did the publisher have input on that? Um, I selected all the authors and typically for um, a contributed volume, people will do calls for papers, but I didn't have to do that because I off the top of my head just knew kind of the people um, who I wanted to write for me. Um, I, you know, hopefully that they were free and willing to do it. Um, and there's so many great scholars out there. Um, so I was able to, pretty easily kind of come up with a list. That's great. And so everybody agreed right away and we're so excited to be part of it, I'm sure. <laughs> pretty much. I don't, yeah, I think almost everyone agreed. I, over the course of um, kind of the book, a couple of authors kind of had to drop out for health reasons or like, you know, one of my, um, I interned at the Smithsonian and Elaine Nichols was my supervisor and she's amazing. She runs a costume collection there. But you know, when we went to COVID, um, you know, mm -hmm. she was like, I manage a lot of people. Uh, you know, she had to like completely switch around um, her, um, 
you know, her workflow and like kind of manage all the people working under her. So she, in the end, she wasn't able to contribute. Um, I do hope that what she was writing, she publishes on her own because she's such an amazing scholar. But, you know, we always adjust with things like that. And, you know, things happen. And of course, COVID happened. So that was a huge. And that's, we're going to get to that. that was a, that's <laughs> one of the questions that we got, actually. Um, and so speaking about the authors and like you knew who you wanted to approach. So the focus is um, divided up into four sections. And I'm going to read what the sections are. I won't read all of the uh, article titles, but section one is anonymous histories. Section two is in the atelier, modistes and independent designers. Section three is into the mainstream, 7th Avenue and beyond. And section four is the star designer, national and international impact. And in each of these, there are three articles. So my question is, how does that structure come about? Did you tell us how, how you put that together? Like, did, did those sections come about after you'd selected the authors or did you see what everybody's topics were and then go from there? Like, how did that come, how did that come together? It kind of happened at the same time. And now that you mentioned, I do remember one thing that the proposal reviewer said was that they wanted more like early content. So I added a chapter from like the 19th century um, in that. Um, so so the, the sections kind of came together with the um, authors. A lot of the, um, the chapter topics I left up to the scholars. I knew that they were great. I knew that they um, had existing research. I wanted them to be able mm. to publish on something um, that they were interested in. So I, I mostly left it up to them. And in the end, it kind of worked out well in the way it fit together. Um, okay. But yeah, I kind of came up with them concurrently. It seems like they just flow so well together with all of the article topics. Like it's I think I was really lucky in the end that it fit together so nicely, especially that like all the sections were even. That like definitely wasn't the case in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, wow, that that seemed very intentional. <laughs> um, so once the project, so you mentioned that some things changed throughout. So another question we got is once the project is underway, how flexible is it to change the content? Um, such as like introducing, like you said, some people had to drop out. So introducing a new author or a new topic or article midway through. Um, Quinton well, was really understanding. No, I'm sure you'll hear some ambient noise. I know. <laughs> we're, we're coming to from downtown Los Angeles and, uh, and New York, New Jersey, right? You're in New Jersey. Yeah, I'm in Jersey City, but like yeah. <laughs> plenty of ambient noise. Yeah. Um, no, Quinton was really flexible about, you know, as, like we kept like the academic standards really high. And honestly, there, there weren't a lot of other books that had been written about black designers. So we really had, you know, we were coming into this um, with a lot of ground to cover. So it wasn't like, you know, someone dropped out and we were afraid like this chapter had been written before or covered by someone mm. else. So, um, but they were really, really flexible and the changes that I had to make, um, they really wanted me to stick to my word count because like that increases um, publication costs as like the work count increases. But other than that, they were really flexible. So rather than the content, they're like more about the logistics of it. Yeah, definitely. And that's so interesting. You know, um, my colleague Lee Wishner made a comment earlier on that you said that there's not a lot of books out there about um, black designers. And I know one of the things Nancy always told us was like, fill the bookshelves. And so, you know, that's sort of what you were doing. And in that case, you do have such flexibility because it's not like it's another book about Dior that you have to talk about a very specific, it's like anything you write is going to be contributing to this field of scholarship. Absolutely. And, you know, with each chapter, each chapter is only 5,000 words. And so like, that's not actually that much. For example, I know you guys, mm. you had Eric Pritchard on who I love and is one of my authors. And you, he yes, a everybody of can watch that um, uh, collection conversation with Dr. Eric Pritchard. It's on our uh, YouTube page and IGTV. Continue. <laughs> and so he wrote about Patrick Kelly and Willie Smith um, for the book. Um, but, you know, in 5,000 pages, you know, he's writing a book about Patrick Kelly, which I'm absolutely dying to read when it comes out. It's going to be but unbelievable. I knew that, like, in that period of thing, he could cover something that he might not cover in the book. Or, you know what I mean? Like, or, you know, so the, it's, it's, a, it's a flexible amount of space where even if you're doing research on another topic, maybe, like, this is something you can expand on that didn't fit into your original topic. Um, it's a really good so, point. It was a really, um, I think, hopefully for my authors, it was a really flexible um, and fun project to work on. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think they would all agree. Um, you, you wrote about um, your, your topics. You wrote two articles, right? Mm -hmm. And one is about 19th and early 20th century uh, Black and New York dress, Black New York dressmakers. And I just wanted to bring that up because that was, was that part of your thesis, correct? Um, my, my thesis focused on two dressmakers, um, Elizabeth Keckley and Anne Lowe specifically. So this was really different. Well, it was different because um, Elizabeth Keckley worked in like the 1860s in Washington, D.C. 
And okay. Anne Lowe was later. She started working in the 1910s, 1920s, um, first in like Florida. And then she didn't come up to New York until like the 30s, um, the late 20s, 30s. So this was looking more at like turn of the century black dressmakers. And I kind of traced them through newspaper ads that they placed. Mm. And I was really kind of interested in the mechanics of how they ran their businesses, the communities they served. I could kind of look at where they were working, you know, in the late 19th century and then where they started to move in the city in the 1910s. And they really followed the black community. So that told me that their clients were primarily black. Um, and so there were different kind of trends that I was able to trace. And, you know, this is a period when New York is starting to come up as um, a fashion capital in manufacturing, not, not recognized yet for design, but definitely in manufacturing. Um, but black women weren't allowed to work in the factories. And so like, how did dressmakers, you know, not just black dressmakers, dressmakers in general, but how did these, um, you know, community of artisans adjust to this new, this new fashion system? So I was really interested in kind of that as a pinching point of kind of when this industry changed. Okay. So it was like, you had topics that you had touched on before, but it sounds like you got a lot more specific with it. Yeah, I was able to really kind of go back to like a lot of newspaper advertisements and kind of try and dig into some of these women. Um, but really, it was a very specific kind of study. Um, but actually, compared to work I've done in, in the past, it was more broad because, you know, with Elizabeth Kecklin and Lowe, I was looking at one individual person. And so right. even though this one was a bit specific, um, it looked at kind of bigger trends in this kind of small population. And you know, that brings up, I'm gonna jump ahead in our questions a little bit, but um, you know, so this whole section, Anonymous Histories, we have um, enslaved wearers and makers as designers in the American fashion system. We have um, slavery, Slavery's Warp, Liberty's Weft, a look at the work of 18th and 19th century enslaved fashion makers. And then your article, 19th and early 20th century black New York dressmakers. Mm -hmm. How, the research process for that must have been so difficult because these are anonymous histories and these stories haven't been told before. Where do you go? You mentioned newspaper articles. Are there other resources that are out there? Well, my two authors who wrote in that section, Jonathan Squire and Katie Knowles, I specifically picked them because they have such great like background in this. And, you know, they were looking at like extant garments. There, were, there are not a ton of extant garments that exist, um, but they really um, know how to like kind of do a material cultural analysis and look at those um, garments and get a lot of information for them. Um, and then um, they look at um, newspapers as well. Um, runaway slave advertisements, they're called. Um, you know, they look at people seeking like self-emancipated peoples. Um, they put out these advertisements and very often they would include what they were wearing. Um, you know, people didn't have a, even normal people, but definitely enslaved people didn't have a ton of outfit changes, you know, like saying they were wearing like a green dress could really help locate them. Um, so they look at all of these different sources and also a lot of kind of more general African-American history, which there is a lot of really wonderful resources. They can kind of look at them in new ways and pull out fashion information from them. Mm -hmm. So these are two scholars who are just really, really adept at that kind of work. And so I knew I wanted to include them because it is very challenging to kind of yeah. find the resources. Yeah, it's interesting you said it really does have to be material culture based. And where are some of those garments located? Those um, enslaved, garment, enslaved people's garments? So Katie looked at um, two um, coats. They were both manufactured by Brooks Brothers, um, mm -hmm. which was at the time based in, I believe, in New York, definitely in the North. Um, but I believe that they were held um, by the Museum of the American South. I don't think that's the right thing. It's definitely footnoted in the book. Um, Katie is very oh, yeah. much uh, <laughs> citation. But they were held in a general history museum. It wasn't a fashion museum somewhere right. in the South. Um, and she also looked at the Civil War Museum. They had um, samples of textiles woven by enslaved women. And then Jonathan, um, in particular, he looked at one dress by this woman um, named Cumber. And this is held at the North Carolina Museum um, of History. And it was amazing because she made this dress for this um, the woman who enslaved her. But someone had written her name, um, you know, her husband's name, and this kind of a couple of sentences that outlined her biography on the hem of the dress. Like this was made by Cumber. Um, so like that's an incredible, an incredible resource um, that Jonathan. There's Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Historic Jonathan. New Orleans collection. <laughs> yes, historic New Orleans collection. <laughs> Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's unbelievable. And it is interesting that a lot of these garments are more in sort of historical societies, history museums. Um, you don't find them in, in like fashion collections or, um, you know, obvious like art museums and things like that. So it, yeah, finding them must be a, a challenge. Absolutely. I'm starting my PhD research um, soon. I'm starting in the fall and that's- Congratulations. Thank you. Looking at um, garments made by Black women between 1865 and 1930, and you know, it has been a challenge to find like those garments. I'm sure that historic societies are actually filled with garments made from Black right. women. It's just not documented. 
a hundred percent right we just don't have that provenance because there wasn't any to, to record exactly um, well that'll be <laughs> quite the challenge for you down the line but i'm sure you will do an amazing job um so i'm going to get back on track with our questions um so let's talk a little bit about going switching from content a little bit back to more the logistics um how did the pandemic change your working process? And were there pros and cons to making a book during the pandemic? Um, there was definitely, I mean, it's definitely for me personally, both because um, it did give me time to like sit at home and write, you know, it took out two hours out of my day that I normally spent commuting. So, you know, I'd work, do my day job and then I would have more time to um, devote to this. Um, but I'm sure for some of my authors, you know, uh, some of my authors like not related to the pandemic, but like moved across the country um, during this period. Um, but I'm sure that I kind of, you know, worrying about family, worrying about like job, you know, what's going on with your day job, all of these things I'm sure contributed to kind of the stress of the situation as a whole. But for me personally, I have to say that like having uninterrupted time to write is really important. I, I can very, very find it very hard to like write for two hours and then stop. So, yeah. um, so that was a plus for me in a, <laughs> in a very, in a very, uh, chaotic, uh, we have to find process. the silver linings, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, and as the editor, what specifically is your role? So like, I know you, you know, you submitted the proposal, you were the main contact, the publisher, um, you are the liaison between all of the authors is are, are all the authors submitting their written pieces to you. And then you do go through and like physically edit them. Yes. So um, I uh, before the manuscript was due to Bloomsbury, I had my um, author send me um, their manuscripts and I went over all of them with them. Some of them, you know, they were in different states. Some of them were done, manuscripted. I went through and I was like, you know, maybe a comma here, maybe change this word. Um, and that was it. And some of them were more kind of in the idea stage. Everyone works differently. Mm -hmm. In the end, everyone's chapter was absolutely stellar. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, people have different processes. So like, you know, we would talk through ideas or like, you know, Again, 5,000 words is a weird, is a weird length. It's like, it's yeah. kind of a lot, but not really a lot to get into. Yeah. So I help them kind of pick and choose like what they wanted to focus on. And sometimes they be like, well, that's really a different essay. Um, so just different authors needed different things for me and I tried to be flexible. And then a lot of it was like organizing stuff. Um, clearing the images is a big part of doing a book. That, that is was one of my questions. Let's talk about that. <laughs> so I helped. Um, undertaking. Yes, no, and I do a lot of image clearance for my day job at the Museum okay. of FIT. Um, so I, I came in with um, some experience, which was great. Um, but uh, yeah, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of um, kind of back and forth on emails and searching. So um, I helped some of my authors with that. Most of them like did a great job kind of tracking down their own images. Um, but I kept everything organized in spreadsheets. I like, you know, made sure, went through all the documentation to make sure like, oh, we can use this one in press. We can't use this one in press, like oh, wow. things like that. Um, making sure like everything was numbered and packaged the way um, Bloomberg was. So there was a lot of logistics, a lot of spreadsheets um, involved Some as well. tedious work in there. Definitely. And was it up to you to make sure like everybody's footnotes matched and, and that kind of thing? Or do they have a copy editor then that goes through that with a fine tooth comb? I tried, I tried my best, but the copy editor did like go through. And so um, I do okay. remember it was last Christmas and um, I went home to see my parents and I sat at their dining room table and I like, that was when I was like copy editing, going through like every copy editor note, making sure like everything was the way um, that they wanted to. And they had like these very meticulous little notes. So um, wow. so working with a copy editor is really, really great um, because that, that they're trained um, to have that eagle eye. When you've read it like a hundred times, you definitely miss things. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Yeah. And Jonathan is saying Liz was great at formatting text. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> I love having one of your authors on. We're like, I know, it's so both nice. Sides of the <laughs> um, and you've now you've been an author and you've contributed to several texts. Um, obviously, like the level of responsibility is different. Do you have um, like a preference? Would you rather, you know, go back to just kind of being the, the author? Or did you really enjoy this role? Um, I did enjoy this role because I really loved in the end. I really love having like bringing my authors together and seeing like this amazing thing that things that they created. And I also, I wrote the intro and then Bloomsbury later asked me to write a conclusion um, to round out the book and um, going through their, their works and like kind of making the connections that, um, you know, point, pulling out different concepts they made and like kind of pulling together. I really love doing that. And I really think mm -hmm. that it's such a, what they wrote is such a valuable source. I was like, I can't wait to like cite things like that. Yes. Like, like, their chapters have already like citing it, even though the book's not technically out yet. And I've been doing it for like months. Um, but 
it's definitely a lot less work just to contribute a chapter to something. Um, so I probably do a little bit more of that, especially if I start my PhD and stuff, definitely not taking on any more big editing projects in right. a couple years. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh. Give yourself some grace with that. Um, <laughs> let's talk about project management. So you do have a full-time job. Um, as we listed in your bio, you're working on several projects, curatorial and writing projects. You haven't started your PhD, but it is eminent. Um, so how do you project manage something like this? Um, I write everything down and I try to keep really, really organized. So I have like a paper calendar that I cross reference with my digital calendar. I have like Excel sheets and I just write everything down to make sure I like make a ton of lists, just make sure mm -hmm. so I don't forget anything and then um, try and just carve out time whenever I can to, to work. Do you do kind of have to like give up a little bit of the social life for a while? <laughs> Definitely. And again, that, during the pandemic, that was again, something that was a little easier because that wasn't an option. So like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but definitely there's a little give and take there. Um, see less of my friends, uh, when things are due and, but I think that's true of everyone. Um, of course. you know, yeah. Um, okay. So another question as a first time editor, what surprised you about this process? Hmm. I, I, you know, because I've done so many contributed volumes and I've done like image permissions with other books for the museum and I've worked really closely with the curators who've been editing volumes. I think I kind of had a really good grip on how it would go. Mm -hmm. um, I mm -hmm. knew that, you know, like you had to pad in some extra time for deadlines. They knew the people, people are late with things because like they have lives. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I was super surprised by anything. I mean, I was, I was not surprised by the quality of my author's work, but I was so, so pleased. And yeah. like, there were definitely like different angles and different things that they came up with um, individually in each chapter that I was surprised and delighted by. But I think I had a really, really good grip of the process because um, we do so many books at the museum. That's so helpful to have that background in it. It really is. Um, <clears throat> was there anything that happened besides maybe a global pandemic? Um, was there anything that happened that you that you learned during this process that you would maybe change for next time? I mean, it sounds like everything went pretty smoothly. Um, I don't know. I think it went pretty smoothly on the overall. Like, there's some hiccups you can't really avoid. Um, there were some, like, images that I just couldn't get, like, in I think the pandemic was also a big contributor to that. People, like, weren't in their offices. There were some images yeah. that I really wanted that I couldn't get. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I guess, I mean, I don't even think it was a time thing. Like, they just, people, like, didn't write back. Um, so, I think maybe, maybe kind of rethinking my, like, approach with images and, like, resources for that but um but no I think it was a really great process my authors made everything yeah. so easy for me so yeah it, that super super helps <laughs> um so we're gonna let's see let's talk a little bit about um the designers that you have included some of the more like from the mainstream section so mm -hmm. you have um let's see you're talking about 7th Avenue and beyond so um Wesley Tan Jay Jackson and Dapper Dan, and then also sort of the star designer, uh, Stephen Burroughs, Scott Berry, which you wrote that one, Willie Ware, Will Smith, and uh, Patrick Kelly. Um, and so again, we talked about the fact that these designers were sort of selected because of the, the scholars that you approached, right? <laughs> were there any that you were like, we can't write this book without including like Patrick Kelly or something? Well, Patrick Kelly is actually funny because I had asked Eric to write about Patrick Kelly, but Patrick Kelly is, is like, he's obviously an American person, but he works in Paris. And so um, I was like, but he's so important. I want to include him and this stuff's so interesting. And so Eric was one who came up and was like, oh, let's, let me, I want to talk about him and Willie Smith, who is such an important American designer. And they just mm -hmm. opened a show with him um, at the Cooper Hewitt. Well, they opened it in 2020 and they have re just reopened <laughs> it. Um, have you been but, able to see the show? Yes, and it was great. Um, my colleague Darnell worked on it, who also, he wrote about Jay Jackson. Jay Jackson was such an interesting person because he was, um, you know, by some accounts, the first black American couturier. He worked hmm. at um, Jean Chirer, uh, um only for about a year or so, but like a lot of exposure um, in haute couture, which is, you know, something we don't think about, not only black people, but black American, American people kind of in general. Um, right. so he was such an interesting figure that I never really heard of, um, maybe just like bits oh. and pieces. And there's a wonderful scholar named Rachel Henderson who's doing even more work on him. Um, she wrote her master's thesis at Parsons on him. Um, but I knew that we couldn't do it without Stephen Burroughs. 
Stephen Burroughs had to be included. And so I turned to um, another NYU alum, uh, Tanya Wilson, who is like sensed not, you know, she does other things. Um, she doesn't necessarily kind of a fashion scholar anymore, though she still keeps her hand in it. She has a day job, she has kids. But I wrote to her and I was like, you did an amazing thesis um, mm -hmm. for NYU for this. Like, can you turn that thesis into a chapter, which she very kindly obliged mm -hmm. on me in doing. But I remember that she did it and I remember reading it. And I remember like, this is like, this is what I wanted to include in the chapter. So for her, I definitely like, reached out to her specifically and was like, this is what I want you to write on. But, yeah. <laughs> but I was just like, definitely the one designer I had to include. I was gonna ask, you know, you, so you were an intern at the Museum of the City of New York. Mm -hmm. Did you help at all with that great Stephen Burroughs exhibition they did? No, that was before I interned there, but that was an excellent, excellent exhibition. It was so good. And um, maybe this is a good transition to show a few of the Stephen Burroughs pieces yeah. in the Pitta Museum collection. And if you have any insights or want to share some stuff you learned about Stephen during this process, um, I'll show, I mean, well, first of all, known for knitwear, a lot of amazing knitwear. So this is actually, we have a really high tech uh, process here <laughs> where we just show printouts. <laughs> I love it. It works. Um, and I forgot to flip them, but so it's going to be like opposite to what it is. But um, so this is actually a two piece knit set. And when this when the top is tucked in, you really can't tell that it, it just looks like a dress. But this is all pieced together. Um, it's a wool. It's a wool jersey blend. Uh, yeah, this is all completely pieced together here. And then in the back. Again, this work is so great. And like what I learned, you know, from Tanya, and you know, other reading about him is that like, even though he is like this American Seventh Avenue designer, the way he made clothes was much closer to couture. And that like, you know, these stretch fabrics are very, very hard to work with. So he had very specific manufacturers and he didn't do like large ready to wear runs. Um, hmm. You know, a lot of it was much more kind of made to order um, smaller batches because um, he was, he would find that like factories couldn't do it. You know, hmm. he had to make sure he found the very right specific factories who could make these for him. Um, but she makes a lot of, Tanya in her chapter makes a lot of really cool um, uh, associations to like 19th century black quilters and how like you're piecing wow. together these, um, these textiles, like kind of creating these canvases out of smaller pieces. And I really love how she put him in such a cool historical context because of course it's like such fun 70s um, kind of stuff. And, you know, he was one of the designers like Halston um, and Scott Berry who you know, really introduced this American style. It wasn't about like what was considered kind of a little more formal, a little fancier, like French couture. It was like relaxed. It was like body conscious. Um, you know, it was this really versatile American style. And it's so important because like this is how we dress today, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Some drag racing happening behind me there, but yeah. <laughs> um, yes, this is how, still how we dress today. It has had such a lasting impact. Um, and I wanted to just ask a little bit about, um, did you, does she get into the uh, Versailles 73 or the Battle of Versailles at all in her article? Oh, can you repeat that? Or you cut out just a little. So sorry. So does she get into the Battle of Versailles at all or his She does talk a bit about the Battle of Versailles. And it was such an important moment for him. It was such an important moment for American fashion and of course models. Um, it was just like the seminal, and like Robin Gavon obviously wrote that amazing book on the Battle of Versailles. If you're interested, please, um, she's an amazing journalist and writer. But yeah, Tanya talks about what an important moment in fashion that was. And Stephen Rose was such a young, talented designer going there. You know, he went with, it was Halston, Oscar de la Renta, Anne Klein, and uh, I'm forgetting someone. Um, it was five of them. I know. I just we just I just watched the Halston miniseries, so I can't think of any other designer. But I mean, it was if you remember like, a comment. <laughs> yes, please. Um, but it was it was just this amazing moment for American designers showing um outside of Paris and like really showing kind of haute couture like what modern fashion looked like, and the fact that Stephen Burroughs was a part of that, such a huge part of it. Um, it he's one of the most important American designers. And really that simplicity too, like that contrast of the French couture, like so still having the quality and the craftsmanship of the couture, but just giving that simplicity and giving the, um, you know, as you mentioned, the body consciousness and the comfort. Uh, I think that was so groundbreaking, especially for those French audiences to see. Uh, you hear stories about people jumping to their feet and like they were electrified by it. Absolutely. I mean, this was modern. It was like, this is modern fashion. It still has an effect on the way we dress. You could wear any of those dresses today and it would still be super cool. Um, it was just this huge break in how people wanted to dress. 
And do do you talk at all about his working with black models and oh, yes. Bill Blass? Thank you, Kelly. Bill Blass, Kelly. yes. That was Kelly. Yes, Kelly. Another one of our NYU colleagues. Yeah, um, um, she does go into that a bit and what an okay. spectacular moment it was for black models. And really, Robin's book is really mostly about the models, I think. Um, yeah. But it was just this incredible moment because these black models were so dynamic. Um, you know like Pat Cleveland would do her spins on stage. And it was just a new way of modeling that was, again, like much more relaxed, much more youthful, much more fun. Mm -hmm. You know, fashion had been, you know, kind of uptight and serious um, before that. Um, you know, breaking up a little bit in the 1960s with Andre Carege and other things like that. But, you know, fashion was a serious, because it was a serious business. Um, people took it very seriously. And, you know, the Americans and the models, it really introduced a sense of fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would say even in the 60s with that sense of fun and the space age and the mod, that wasn't exactly fashion for everyone. Whereas I feel like these black designers introduced things that everyone could wear, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the street, walking around. You're not exactly going to wear like a Paco Rabanne walking, or, you know, walking around yeah. uh, New York. So, um, you know, I don't know, maybe that's a little bit off, but it seems to me it was a little bit more approachable. But again, still having that craftsmanship and in on ingenuity. Um, and I, let me just show, actually, I did have one more question about Stephen yeah. Burroughs. So you mentioned that some of the clothing was kind of limited edition or he did really small runs, you know, here's the label for that garment. And again, I forgot to flip it, but it says Stephen Burroughs world. Mm -hmm. um, so were there things that he produced under that line as well as like one offs for clients or was it mostly always under Stephen Burroughs world label? He definitely did one offs for clients. Like definitely. I think a lot of, I mean, I think just designers, like, I mean, I think today still they do that a lot of that, but like sure. you know, a lot of these famous designers in the seventies, they would, you know, they were all part of like the Studio 54 scene. They were friends with a lot of celebrities. So they did a lot of like one-offs for celebrities. Um, but Stephen Burroughs World was um, a label that he had um, through Henry Bendel. Um, mm -hmm. And he had like this little, like boutiques were becoming such a big deal, like, you know, freestanding boutiques that department stores kind of copied that motto and have these little in-house boutiques, which I guess they still do. Um, and so they gave him a in-house boutique called Stephen Burroughs World. And that's where he sold all of everything. He got to decorate it himself and kind of create this little boutique within the department store. And the Stephen Burroughs World was the label he sold there. You know, I, we have a really cool connection to um, Henry Bendel's through the Finna Museum. One of our donors, um, Do John, Joan and Donald Damask, uh, Donald worked at Bendel's uh, throughout the 90s, 80s. 80s and 90s and um, really had relationships with all of these designers and their little boutiques you know we have little Polaroids and snapshots of them like Gautier at parties with Gautier and um, you know Andre Leon Talley and um, Zandra Rose and it, it's he, he had such a cool uh, exposure to fashion at that time and he donated a lot of the ephemera and um, you know party invitations and things like that um, that he received. So one of the things he donated to us, and this is from, this is actually from 93. So this is later in Burroughs' career, but this is a sketch um, that we had in our exhibition of the Damasks donation, which was uh, Inspired Eye. And one of the things I love about it is, first of all, you can see the movement. Mm -hmm. And like, that was so huge for him, I think. Absolutely. And also the fact that it's on butcher paper and I remember this from the Museum uh, of the City of New York exhibition that he did most of his sketches on butcher paper. Did you learn more about that or why that was his preference or anything? I did not. I mean, I, I imagine that like, you know, it's like huge, it's available and it's like large pieces of paper that you kind of just go wild on. But um, yeah. no, I didn't know. I didn't learn about that specifically. Um, but I do love that you guys have this piece because Stephen Burroughs, like, he's really known for his work in the 70s, but he's still around. He's still doing things. He just did a collaboration with Target like last year or the year before. Um, really? So, yeah. So like his stuff is like definitely around he's and he's had such an influence influence on fashion um and ongoing and on younger designers i think for mm -hmm. sure absolutely um i'll just show a couple more pieces again like talking about things that are so relevant here is a color blocked um jersey knit maxi dress like i mean you could just see this anybody wearing this now but color blocking was really big for him too right He's so, so known for like this color block jersey. It was so fun. It was so easy to wear. It was so, um, it was so vibrant at that time. It was pretty new, it, you know, with this is, and like, again, you see his influence because like you could see this on the street today, but you probably have seen this on the street today. It's probably not an original Stephen Burroughs. Like a lot of people are kind of um, influenced by his style. But when he was doing this, people thought it was like crazy and wild. Like, you know, he'd mix all these really? colors. He would talk about how like every season he would pick seven colors and he would just like mix them all together and like, create these different oh. combinations. Um, 
So I mean, like his color sense was just like so off the charts. Like so, it was so exciting. And you, like you said, even though we see it and we think like, oh, it's so modern and we can wear it today, it does have that Burroughs feel to it. I think because of the colors. I think you're absolutely right. Did I lose you? <laughs> I, I there. You like it, it'll pause a little bit, but then I'll hear like hear you all at once. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just talking super fast for our conversation. Uh, I'm going to show one more Burroughs piece. This one doesn't quite have, we don't have any that have that um, Burroughs lettuce hem. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the exhibition that we went to, um, that was something that they really hit on was the fact that this lettuce hem, this lettuce, lettuce edged hem was something that he introduced into kind of the high fashion world. Um, it was a, another one of his trademarks. Why do you think that was such a big, I mean, we look at it now, we're like, yeah, it's a lettuce hem. Like, why, why do you think that made such a big impact? You know, again, I think it's something that was completely new. And he talks about how, like, he kind of came up with this um, on accident. But before he, before he kind of created the lettuce hem, he was known for using contrasting thread. So the fact okay. that he used contrasting thread on it really made it a design, even stand out even more as a design feature. But he was so, sewing the, the fabric, the stretch fabric, through the finishing machine, the marrow machine, and he was pulling on it. And when you pull on it, like, you know, the stretch, and when you, you're done, it's like, you know, the stretch goes back and the stitching stays where it is. So it creates like this rippled hem. And like other people might think like, oh, this is a mistake. Let me start over. Mm -hmm. But he really saw the beauty and the versatility in that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it is something that's always around. You know, like those baby tees from like the 2000s and they always have yes! like, a rippled hem. Like they're everywhere. It's something that like always, and so it's so funny to think that like one person invented that. But, you know, that was, it was his signature. He was the one who made that popular, even if he wasn't, he, made it he didn't invent it. Yeah. Yeah. As we learned in fashion history, nobody invented anything, yeah. guys. <laughs> no. Take the word invented out of your vocabulary. Um, sometimes people just hit the zeitgeist and they exactly. introduce the right concept at the right time. Mistake or not. Way to add movement and like, like a dynamic kind of um, element to his fashion. I feel like a lot of femininity too, when you have those flowing garments with the, you know, with that ruffling hem, it's, it's very, it almost feels, it feels delicate, um, even though the outfit could be even a little bit more sporty because of the mm -hmm. material and the fabric, um, it kind of adds a little bit of uh, femininity. Yeah. And you mentioned con contrasting thread, and I just want to show our last Stephen Burroughs garment. Um, this is another, it's a wrap dress, another, um, I believe this one is synthetic, uh, synthetic jersey. Um, but we, again, see that beautiful color contrasting with the sleeves and um, with the belt, this beautiful, bright sunshine yellow. But I'm just going to give you a close-up here because, again, I just think this is such a deceptively simple dress. We do have the contrasting red. It almost looks like Rick Racks, um, but it's, you know, it's just the thread there. Um, yes, zigzag that zigzag, thread. that red zigzag that he, it really became his signature. Oh, really? Oh, my gosh. And then another thing I thought was interesting is this part, like it's pieced together there at the top. So it's not just a simple wrap dress. This is actually, you know, that's a separate panel. It's really hard to see in the picture, but it, it is a wrap dress that has been, um, you can see it a little bit better on this side, that's been pieced together just as we saw with those other block, uh, block color dresses. And I think like the thing about Burroughs and like a lot of people who were working at that time is like they went to fashion school, like they knew how to do it like the quote unquote right way, but they were experimenting and they wanted to do things differently. They wanted to do new things. And so they come up with all of these different like different mm. pattern making and piecing techniques. He like made, he worked a lot in like leathers and things like that. And he would like cut them up and weave them back together and like do things like that. He was just really experimental. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. I You never think of him with leather, but, um, but yeah, that's right. I remember seeing that some of that in the exhibition. Was there a catalog from that exhibition? There was, I think. I think okay. that there is a catalog for that. So if you guys are interested in Stephen Burroughs, that's a great way to explore him. And again, so much more to do. Like he's somebody I think who's been severely underrepresented <laughs> in research and stuff. So um, let's also, I really want to talk about Scott Berry because that was one of the articles that you wrote. Um, and we have one Scott Berry piece in our collection and it was somebody that was new to me when I came to the museum. Um, so your article is Scott Berry designing 1970s New York. Um, and I, yeah, I just want to talk about what you learned about him and, and why you think he's somebody that isn't maybe as remembered as Patrick Kelly or, um, Stephen Burroughs. Well, I mean, Scott, at the time, Scott Berry was really famous. Like he was like on national talk shows, like he was in all wow. the press, like he was a really prominent designer and, you know, we've kind of forgotten about him. Fashion history, I always say, has a really short memory. Like we've forgotten a lot about Amer a lot about a lot of American designers who are really who were really hmm. popular at one time. 
Um, I don't, I'm not really quite sure why he's kind of less remembered than Stephen Burroughs. I think that Burroughs, Burroughs' stuff like such, captures such a distinct moment in fashion history that like it cannot be ignored. I mean, the mm. fact that he was at Versailles um, was so, so seminal. But Patrick, or Stephen, or, uh, Scott <laughs> Berry, Scott Berry like was, people compare them a lot because he also worked a lot with jerseys, but his stuff was much more, so, Sophisticated, not as like a, not as like a negative comparison to um, Stephen Burroughs, whose stuff was just much more like youth oriented and fun. Um, Scott Berry's was um, kind of a little bit more grown up. It was very like glamorous and slick. Um, but I decided to write about him because I just found this amazing resource after I'd done Black Fashion Designer um, at the Museum of IT. I got like a random call from this woman named Robbie Marks, who had been Scott Berry's business partner. Her and her husband both were his business partners. Yes, yes. And so I knew that I had this spectacular resource in my head. Like I never really worked on anything from the seventies. I'd done a lot more work on 19th century, early 20th century things. Yeah. But I wrote down her name and I was like, I'm going to recommend her to someone. Someone has to interview her and get her story because this is an incredible piece of fashion history. Yeah. And in the end I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And so I flew out to Denver and I interviewed her. Wow. I'm still in touch with her. She's such an amazing woman. Um, but she ran um, Scott Berry's business, um, you know, from like the late sixties all the way to like, when he like kind of closed it down, I believe like at the end of the seventies, early eighties. Um, and you know, she was also this incredible person. She was like at FIT, she was a model, um, you know, she had kids, she and her husband ran this business. And um, it's just like incredible things that she was able to tell me, um, you know, he was black and obviously, you know, there was a lot of discrimination there, but she was this like this very young white woman. And she said that, you know, she, when she got into fashion, she was in um, working for Scott Berry. She was sitting in a meeting with a fabric manufacturer and they're just sitting there in silence. And she's like, she's like wondering what's, what's going on. And he turns to her and he's like, when is your father going to get here? Like, when can we start this meeting? And she was like, <laughs> I mean, like, the, it, you know, it was a different, a really different, well, hope, like, you know, maybe sometimes not so different world yeah. in the 1970s. But she was also able to just give me not only incredible insight into how they ran their business, but kind of just like what the fashion industry was like in the 70s. It was smaller. This was really like the heyday of American design in the garment industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything was manufactured there. Like, you know, Scott Berry had his own factory. Like, you know, like Stephen Burroughs, like he needed to make sure that he had really skilled technicians who could work with these jersey pieces. Um, but just like getting that insight into what the fashion industry was like is so, so, so interesting. And how did they, now I, we wrote about the piece that we have in our collection. I did a little bit of Scott Berry research and I remember coming across her name and they met because she was a model, right? Isn't that well, how their paths crossed? No, she was working at a boutique called Allen and Cole, which is also a boutique that Stephen Burroughs um, sold in. Um, okay. But she worked at the boutique and Scott Berry would come in and sell pieces on commission. Um, and so okay. he would make custom pieces for um, for women who would come in um, and he would, you know, come in. That's how they met. And like he would talk to her, you know, about running his business. And, you know, he was not like necessarily the greatest business person, like so, so many creative people, like so many designers. So he really needed someone to run the business part of it. And she had was um, still a student or she had just graduated from FIT in um, fashion merchandising. So she was able to take like literally those skills that she had learned um, in school and apply it to this business. And they were able to run this like wildly successful business um, for over 10 years. Wow, that is such a, that, it's just one of those stories that thank goodness you got that oral history and recorded it because it could have just been like lost to time. Absolutely. Um, uh, that is a definite push for oral histories, especially with the, the recent past. You know, we don't think of the 70s as that long ago. I'm one of those people who always thinks the 70s is 30 years ago. Like yes, everything same. will always be <laughs> from the year 2000. But it's, you know, it's near and on 50 years ago. So we, we do need to record these stories and reach out to these people who were involved in the business at the time. Absolutely. I mean, they can give you insight and things like my, my, main, my main source um, of research um, sources for the Scott Berry um, uh, article was um, WWD. Like, you know, okay. they're archived and you can go back and read like, um, and they, get, they can give you really great business um, information. They um, give you reviews of shows. They give um, like articles and profiles of the designers. So it's a really great um, tool because they, you know, they write about like, they write about him when he was like running his first business out of his apartment and like things like wow. that. So you can really trace him through that. But you know, other than that, there's not much out there on him. Um, you know, when he was more famous, um, some other publications covered him. But like Robbie was able to tell me, Robbie and Steven were able to tell me things that like I just never would have known. Also like, not just like kind of the facts, but like how they felt about things, how the wow. business was going, you know? They talked about how his showroom was like this place where all these models like Pat Cleveland and Grace Jones and Amon would hang out, but like 
um, Robbie also had her kids and her dogs like running around. And it was just <laughs> this really like fun place. Like other showrooms could be really stuffy, but like everyone wanted to hang out there because it was so fun. Don't you just wish you could be a fly on the wall in that scenario? How much would you love to have seen that and witnessed that and those conversations and all of the creativity and fun? Oh, must have been amazing. Yeah, it was so, it was, it was such a, it was such an amazing experience getting to talk to her. And I think we've seen, well, so this is another um, uh, issue to bring up is, um, you know, Ebony does a lot of fashion coverage. And I know we've found a few of Scott Berry resources in Ebony. Um, were any of these, I know Patrick Kelly was, were Stephen Burroughs and Scott Berry featured in the Ebony Fashion Fair shows that traveled around? Yes, absolutely. And one of, um, one of the images I was able to con include in my chapter was an image of the model Audrey Smaltz. So Audrey still has a fashion production company, but she's been modeling since like the 1950s. Uh, but she worked at Ebony, she worked for Eunice Johnson, and for a wow. few years, she was um, a commentator. So she would like, um, like, you know, provide this like fabulous descriptions of these um, um, garments as they were coming down the runway. And the image I included of her is a dress that she actually donated to the Museum of FIT for Black Fashion Designers. And she's oh. wearing a Scott Berry dress like oh sitting in a chair with her microphone, like, um, you know, commenting on the show. Um, so they were able to include um, black designers um, in the shows, but also she wore them as part of her everyday life and kind of, um, you know, showcased them in that way too. Oh, I'd love to see that because you have seen the real world application of how the dresses were worn is like so, so critical for styling and for context to, to understand that. Um, I'll give a quick shout out to our intern, Aisha Coppin, who is doing a three-part series on the Ebony Fashion Fair on our blog. So keep your eye out for that. It'll be over the next month, I think, we'll, we'll schedule all three of her posts. Um, so she has more. She mentions Audrey Smalls and, and goes into a little bit more depth. But um, I do want to show our Scott Berry garment that we have. And I'm, again, going to talk about Joan and Donald Damas because it was um, actually her wedding dress was Scott Berry. So here we have it on display in that same Inspired Eye um, uh, exhibition that we had in, next to her husband's suit. He wore um, an Armani suit. And she it wasn't made to be a wedding dress. She saw it in the window of a department store and just thought it looked, um, you know, fun and comfortable. It was 1979. Um, it's a cream two-piece lace skirt and blouse. And yeah, she said she just felt really good in it. And it just had the kind of aesthetic. It has a it almost has a little bit of a blush tone to it. Here's a, here's a close-up of the textile. Oh, wow. And it's so beautiful. And she looked, I'm going to show their wedding. She'll probably get embarrassed. She's, but she, the wedding picture is so charming. I just have to show it. So here they are. <laughs> Perfect. I had never <laughs> seen this until you sent this to me earlier. So I love this picture. I know. It's so great. So there's Donald and Joan in 1979 on their wedding day. And she just looks gorgeous in her Scott Berry. But I think, you know, it's so true that he just made women feel good in his clothes and she felt comfortable. She felt glamorous. Um, here's another close up of that textile. And one of the things that I really came to appreciate about about Scott Berry, because we do have several of his pieces in our museum and I was able to really analyze them in depth for the um, for the chapter, is that like he was really an amazing example of what Seventh Avenue could do. It was really high quality. It was technically difficult fabrics. And this was all off the rack. Um, you know, wow. you go into a department store, you buy it. Um, so really, New York became a fashion capital around like these, like these styles that were much more modern, much more youthful. But they were also, you know, since the 1920s and before were a manufacturing powerhouse, and they just got it down perfect. They could mm -hmm. turn out these really high quality clothes, you know, high end designer clothes. It wasn't haute couture, but that wasn't the way people were living their lives in the 1970s. Right. And um, so he's just a really great example of like the quality that was possible. And you look at these clothes and it's different from how clothes are made today because there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more hand details. So even though it's made by a factory, um, you know, there'll still be like a hand stitching around the zipper sometimes because like, you know, the fabric won't really take a machine in that way. Um, so there's a lot, it was very, very high quality. Um, but it was just such a, it was such a cool example of like, you know, this mm. is an example of high end New York fashion. And when do you, when in your research, like when does that sort of start to drop off? When do you really start to see things kind of going overseas for manufacturing? You know, because I know there was kind of the resurgence with like DKNY and Calvin Klein and, and those brands. Is it in the 90s, early 2000s? When does I mean, the Avenue start to kind of decline? I think definitely by like the, the 90s, I would say okay. that that was a trend that was happening. But you know, it's, it's, it's happening in bits and pieces, you know, throughout this period. 
one of the things that Willie Smith was known for was working with Indian cottons. And that was totally new at that time. Like nobody was importing like um, these, like, you know, beautiful, lightweight, colorful cottons. Um, but even then we start to see like globalization happening. Mm. I mean, it was definitely not like, you know, he wasn't doing it on the scale of like someone like H&M. He was looking for, you know, like kind of to bring this like global, um, these global resources to create something unique for himself. Um, but we see people kind of going overseas. Um, I mean, I guess starting like in by the 80s, by the 90s. Um, wow. And so, I mean, there's still some factories, especially sample makers around the garment district, which is where the Museum of FIT is. But it's, it's, it doesn't seem like it was in the, I mean, it wasn't like it is in the 70s. Like it just seemed like such a bustling, exciting place. You know, you see those pictures of people like just rolling racks. Rolling the, the racks. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so definitely a huge change from the way fashion was made. Um, in New York to now. Yeah. And, you know, maybe with Scott Berry, like, leaving the business, uh, leaving his business partner, if he wasn't such a savvy business person, it was probably hard for him to keep up in that environment of, like, how bustling and how busy and how fast things were moving. Um, if he was on his own or if he had to find a new business partner, that, that might have been why he uh, maybe isn't as remembered now. And, yeah, it's true. Well, I also think that, like, you know, we think about people like YSL, who we know so much about, but Pierre Bourget is, like, not only, I mean, up until recently he's still alive, but he was actively promoting his legacy. I mean, it's such a good thing, obviously, still around. So, like, but, you know, there are companies that are around, like, Perry Ellis, and people don't really know who Perry Ellis is. But, right. like, you know, I think we remember designers when there's someone actively championing their, um, their memory. Um, that's such a good point. So I think that's, a, a you know, in fashion, it's always on to the new. Um, and, you know, Americans don't, American fashion doesn't really have the same kind of heritage type of, um, kind of culture like we had in France where like it's like Chanel and Balenciaga, but there's still like tons of couturiers who are very, very popular in like the 1920s. We have no idea about today. So. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Sometimes I see labels and I'm like, how, this is an amazing gown. How have I never heard of this before? Absolutely. Like, you're so right. It's like, who has the archive? Who has the rep? Who's, you know, kind of out there uh, making the museum or making the online archive or, and that's getting to be so big too now with these, like every house having its own archive. So it'll be interesting to see in 20 years who we're remembering and, and louding really. Yeah. Um, we are about four minutes away from our hour. <laughs> I can't believe how fast this is. <laughs> I went. know. Um, and you know, now you're doing that. You're being the advocate for these designers. So thank you so much. And thank you to all of your authors who are preserving these legacies and, getting this information out there and filling the bookshelves, really. Absolutely. The work that they've been doing, I mean, I know that like all of them, like they did this tiny little piece for me, but they're going on to do like even more research, even more uh, publishing and things like that. So like, they're definitely, this is like a great little group of people that I was lucky enough to kind of, you know, put together in my book, but like definitely scholars to watch to fill up those bookshelves. Well, maybe there, when everything is back open again, you can do some sort of like online symposium or <laughs> a conference. It would be great. Like, no I mean, this has been such an interesting hour, and I know I would love to hear from every single one of your authors. Um, it, it, it just is going to be the most amazing contribution to our field. Um, so thank you so much for all of your hard work. And tell people how they can buy your book. Um, so it's made, um, it's published by Bloomsbury. So um, it doesn't go on sale in the United States until August 26th, but it is available from pre-order from bloomsbury.com. Um, I'm not quite sure about physical bookstores and where it will appear then, uh, but okay. I, I buy most of my books online, so... Uh... So, um, yeah. Oh, hi, Eric. Think... Eric's on there, oh, too. Oh, <laughs> yay, hi. Um, um, and so do you already have your copy? You already have your advanced copy? I do. I do have my copy. I think I have it. I must have it. Oh, here it is. Give us a little sneak peek. So this is the book. Yay. And I was able to put Scott Berry um, on the cover, too, which I was really, really happy about. Oh, I um, love it. That's such an amazing image. Yeah. So much joy. And have your authors seen the final copy yet? Yes, they, all of them should have received their copies too. I emailed them like, if you didn't receive it, email me and no Let one did. Know. So hopefully all of them have theirs in hand. Um, and then our last question from the audience was, uh, what do you have coming up? I know you've got a couple of projects, both curating and writing. Can you tell us what you're working on? Yes. So um, at the Museum of FIT, um, I've uh, co-curated a show with my colleague, Melissa Mara at um, Alvarez. That's going to open, I believe, this fall. It was put on hold, so it's open last year, um, called Head to Toe, which looks at women's accessories. Um, we're also working on a show together on food and fashion, which we're super excited about. But that'll be um, fall 2023, so kind of uh, in a bit far. I'm also co-curating with um, an amazing professor that we have at FIT, Elena Romero, who's an hip, uh, expert on hip-hop fashion. We're doing 50 Years of Hip-Hop Fashion, February 2023. 
2023 is the 50 year anniversary of hip hop. Um, wow. And then I'm working on a show much further out, um, looking again at black designers, but it's um, on the African diaspora and how um, black designers kind of interpret the um, diasporic themes through their fashion. That's at MFIT. Um, I'm guest curating an exhibition at um, Winterter Museum in Delaware on Anne Lowe, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, that'll be September 2023. So like lots of things like yeah, going 2023, down, coming down the fight. Don't call Liz in 2023, it sounds like. <laughs> I'm going to be really, really happy when 2024 rolls around. Yeah. Are you, um, and is the Winterter exhibition also going to have a publication with it? Or is that yes. just a... Wow. I believe it will. So, um, you know, details are still pending on that, but definitely be on the lookout to that. Or if you're in Wilmington, Delaware, come and stop by in 2023. Um, but yeah, I have lots of kind of things. And you're starting your PhD everywhere. program. And tell us again what your focus is going to be in your PhD work. So I'm going to be at Central St. Martin's um, and I'm going to look at, um, it's like, it's in fashion curation. So it's going to be like a proposed exhibition is my project. And it looks at the way black women um, engage with respectability politics in fashion between 1865 and 1930. Um, so it's very, um, it's kind of like my dream exhibition that I don't know if I'd ever be able to put together in real life, um, but that'll just be my PhD project. So I don't know that okay. it'll exist in real life anyway. Maybe in 2024. <laughs> Maybe in like 20, like 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liz, you are a, a brilliant, brilliant scholar and, and such a wonderful friend too. Um, I'm so, so happy to have had this chance to work with you um, and to, to talk about your project. Um, I'll say goodbye to the beautiful Liz. I very awkwardly once introduced Liz at a, at a symposium as the beautiful Liz. So I've never quite lived that down, but um, <laughs> I'll take it always. <laughs> I'm so, so happy that you were able to speak with us. And I'm just so incredibly proud and impressed with all of the work you're doing. Thank you so much for the scholarship you're contributing to our field. You truly are, as one of our viewers is saying, you truly are a Wonder Woman. So uh, we can't, we can't wait to see all of these projects come to fruition and we'll call you in 2024. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Joe. It was so much fun speaking with you. This was awesome. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.